I actually am from Mars. I've never stood in a red circle before either in my entire life, so if I t tend to wander, someone can yell at me to come back. It's a very interesting perspective that we have as a privately held company, Mars Incorporated, that we utilize the ability to make decisions differently than most companies. And because of that, what I'll talk about today for the next 17 minutes and 29 seconds will illustrate what we think is the game changer on how people think. And the title of my uh, presentation is really, uh, I think, key. It's all about uncommon collaborations, if you will. And sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm a magician. I go out into the field as a plant breeder, move pollen from one plant to another in a way that's been done for over 10,000 years. And I create new cultivars, sometimes I'm working in a modern plant science lab working with sequencing machinery. But the key is that what we do when we start to think about solution is we pose more questions beyond our normal expectations to consider what is really possible. And that, that is the point. What is really possible? What are those things that stand outside your norm and keep you up at night in curiosity? And solutions, though, cannot be found in isolation. It takes a vast network. And the term external research is really taken seriously at Mars Incorporated because we can't always look inside. We become tunnel vision. We must look outside as well. These collaborations, these unprecedented partnerships, they build real sustainability. And you can't do it by yourself, no matter how big we are. And we're a large, privately held company. You must move beyond the idea stage to the implementation of scalability. What we do know is that everything is on the move. Everything is transformed by nature and forced into new paths. One thing withered by time decays and dwindles. Another emerges from ignominy and waxes strong. Thus, nature as a whole is altered by constant, unrelenting pressure. And what I do is because of personal experiences. It's not only because I sit in a science lab it's not only because I've spent years and years and years in the field, and it's now almost four decades of constant work in the field, it's because of personal experiences. I'm obligated to see the world not only through my eyes as a trained scientist in observation techniques and pattern recognition, I'm also trained as an anthropologist, so I see in systems. But as a collaborator, I am obligated to see the world through the farmer's eyes and understand his or her, her views no matter how much I think I know. And this means, specifically, I must reject all dogma. Dogma has no place in my scientific language. I must embrace uncertainty. I must dismiss prejudice and the precautionary principle. This calls me to task, and this shakes me out of my personal complacency. But how do we understand? How do we really understand the stress and shocks to a system? And how do we work to anticipate those in occurrences is really the critical question that we have to ask ourselves. And the view that nature is so robust that it will respond to any attack when we have taken so much capital from it is not true any longer. So how much robustness is left in the system of nature? We are now faced with the adaption to infinite variability in a way that we did not think about even 10 years ago. Sometimes knowledge comes from mythology. Not the mythology of aliens, but the mythology of things that are written down. The tree of knowledge and the tree of sin. My, today my comments are really about this little simple tree, the first illustration ever in the Codex Alimentaris, I mean the Codex Bedanus. It's a tree whose seeds deliver one of the greatest joys in mankind. The tree is Theobroma cacao, the food of the gods, and for the women and men who grow it around the world for the last hundred years, and really for probably three to 4,000 years from when it was domesticated in Mexico, we look at this and we think that this is the essential ingredient in chocolate, something we all uh, love and like to have. So mythology, the tree of knowledge and the tree of sin. 
Originally, Christ gave this tree to the Quiche people in the Mayan highlands of Guatemala. And he gave it to them because at a certain point in time when he was being chased by his adversaries, he took refuge in the forest. And to escape, he hid under a cocoa tree. Whereupon the tree immediately blossomed and covered him in white flowers, which are the flowers of the bloom of the cocoa tree. And because of the tree's help, Christ told the tree that it would be blessed and that in the cocoa fruits would be the beverage for use only in ceremonies. And thus it became the drink of the gods. And according to the quiche, the gift of cacao was given to perpetuate his memory. And as such, it became the tree of knowledge to perpetuate Christ's memory. But then humans became greedy, which is not so hard to understand. And the seeds of the cacao tree were used as currency. And the meaning behind the original gift of the cocoa tree was lost. And through the centuries, this once fabulous tree of knowledge became converted to the tree of sin. And you must know what you know about through history as well. And this is part of the work I've done for years and years is working on the history of cacao in Mesoamerica, especially in Oaxaca, Mexico. And you need to know the linguistics because how do you talk about a topic if you don't know the linguistics? And so we created a nodal linguistic map of 26 Mayan languages. And these are just a few of the words that refer to the domesticators and the first ways they describe cacao. You must know where cocoa comes from. At one point, they thought there were two origins, but in fact, there's only one origin for cocoa. It's the upper Ukulele Valley, which is illustrated here. And there's 10 distinct structure groups of these trees. And we must do more with less, and then we must do more again with less, which begins what I really want to talk to you about. And a friend of mine, Jason Clay, made this statement to me years ago, and it's been a rallying cry. And why is that? Because we're running out of biological capital. And what does that mean? So here's a picture of the Mata Atlantica rainforest, the most biodiverse rainforest in the world with over, over 250 species of trees per hectare. This is 1945. This is 1960. This is 1973. This is 1990. Less than 3% of the forest is uh, now in place from 1945 to 2010. We have no more land to claim in places like this. We must reclaim this land and make it productive again. Inefficient farming at the expense of forests. Here's Cote d'Ivoire, the world's largest producer of cocoa beans. 40% of the uh, production in the world comes from Cote d'Ivoire. This was 1958. This is 1993. You can see the dark green has largely disappeared, which was the diverse forest. So cocoa farmers cannot exist in West Africa on yields of 450 kilos per hectare. That's poverty. And when we think about we're buying chocolate sometimes and it's on the backs of people who are only producing this amount of product per hectare, it's a problem. So imagine if you have 400 kilos per hectare, it takes 5 million hectares to give you 2 million metric tons. But if you grow 500 kilos, it only takes 4 million hectares. And if you grow 660 kilos, it only takes 3 million hectares. And you can do the math. At one ton, it takes 2 million hectares. And at two tons, or 2,000 kilos per hectare, it takes a million hectares. So what does this represent? It means that at 450 kilos, we're cutting down every tree that exists in the world. But at 1,000 or 2,000 kilos per hectare, we're saving all this land for other things, forests, food, ecology, environment, culture, social, economic values. So this is what happens. It takes the same number of trees that are highly productive, only four times the amount of space is needed on a farmer's land to do this. So we did this thing because I was worried that we had no way to understand the cocoa tree. And after having it cultivated for hundreds of years, literally millions of years from eternity to this point, that we didn't have a road map to do anything. Everything was phenotypic. So on June 25th, 2008, I was fortunate to be able to announce that Mars Incorporated was going to lead an unprecedented and uncommon collaboration. And what does that mean? People who don't normally work together. But on September 15th, 2010, I also had the fortune to announce that we had finished it three years ahead of time. And 
we released it to the public domain. And this is a key point of this entire activity. As a corporation who makes profit, we have the ability to make decisions called freedom. And in that process, one of the things we did is that we did not need to own this information. We wanted everyone to have free and unfettered access. A big paradigm shift. And this was the unprecedented, never before put together type of collaboration. Private corporations, Federal Institute, U.S. Department of Agriculture, IBM, a public corporation, and all these other people, this is the team that did it. A collaborative effort. And we launched the genome. And then the question you have to ask yourself, why is this important? And why does this make a smarter planet? Because for six and a half million small farmers, this cocoa genome is the first time they've had a roadmap to help breed trees for them to become more productive. They lose $700 million a year to insects, boring diseases, drought, what have you. And as it's cold here today in Amsterdam, think about the tropics. Nothing ever goes to sleep. Nothing ever rests. Things mutate and change constantly. So in the great north that we're in today, plants have a chance to take a break. Soil gets a rest, but never in the tropics. So the notion of why chocolate matters to a smarter planet is because six and a half million small farmers' lives depend upon it. And this is what we deliver, more cocoa, uh, fewer trees, fewer hectares. We get to save land, better management of the farm, reduction of fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. We can diversify the portfolio of the farmers because we have land left over taken out of production and we can protect the remnant forests. There's hardly anything less. This is our website, I invite you to visit it. You'll find out when you log on to it that everything you can have access to, everyone else has access to as well, including our competitors. And this is what you get from looking at a, a genomic map. We discovered a disease resistant in the quality trait loci, linkage group one through five. And what happens is we start to see that something unusual is occurring that represents disease resistance. And then we can make all these assumptions based on that to help us breeding traditional cocoa trees. Pollen from one plant to another, just the way it's been done for decades and millennium. We also use a technique called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Because with this, or SNPs, we take this huge map of letters called A, C, G, and T, which would fill this room. It's a small genome. A big genome would fill this entire part of Amsterdam. But through this, we've been able to train farmers to utilize a very simple tool to make decisions faster. So it's not going out in the field and only looking at the trees. It's also looking at the molecular basis of the trees to accelerate traditional breeding. We will not certify poverty, point two. Certification, what does it give you? And why do we call it certification plus? Well, at 450 kilos, that's poverty. But with a little training, you get another 170 plus kilos of cocoa. With better improved germplasm, which we have in the pipeline, you can get 500 to 600 kilos. And with fertilizer or compost, whatever your favorite is, you can get up to 1,500 to 1,800 kilos from 450 kilos in five to six years. Are we talking about poverty or are we talking about a change? So certification plus is about that change. It's a social change, it's a cultural change because it allows to stay intact the part of the world that these people live in. It's an environmental change. We reduce the amount of chemicals put on the ground. It's an ecological change because we no longer have to force ourselves to cut down more forests to satisfy our desire for chocolate. And fifth and most important possibly, it's economic. Because it's very difficult as a farmer if you're not doing well, if you can't feed your family, to make a decision to change. Where does chronic malnutrition and hunger exist? In the neotropics. Where is chocolate grown? In the neotropics. What happens with chronic hunger and malnutrition? You never recover as a small child. We have farmer field schools. We signed a memorandum of understanding, Mars Incorporated, with the government of Cote d'Ivoire. Uncommon, unprecedented collaboration. You can read the promise, but basically it says two things. We will lead with them to help make decisions. We will make specific on-the-ground investments. 
put your money on the table. You can talk about doing stuff, but if you're not willing to put your money on the table, it doesn't really mean very much. Mars investment in deep analysis of the cocoa sector and in relationship building at Cote d'Ivoire has given us a unique opportunity. It's not what normally happens. It's not the nature of what really goes on most of the time. There is no simple answer to any of these questions. And that is probably the most important thing I can tell you. We need to simultaneously restore biological resources and natural capital. We need to fix the livelihoods, but not only livelihoods as we talk about finance, we need to also develop sustainable nutrition. We have sustainable agriculture. We have to have sustainable nutrition. They go hand in hand. You can't talk about them separate from each other. The question is, are we able to accomplish this task as collaborators? And herein lies the issue. Are we willing to take a hard look at our practices and say we are really sustainable? Are we willing to develop the logic to get there? Are we willing to secure the commitments to make it happen? This exercise, this collaboration, if done well, will change the way we think today, tomorrow, and the future. But we must not avoid complex questions or technologies. And this is an intentional choice of a company like Mars and our collaborators. Built out of the faith that there are new answers to old problems of a sustainable future where social, cultural, ecological, environmental, and economic issues are an integral part of every solution. But the final question today is, are we committed to build diverse collaborations to succeed? Are we really willing to embrace complex solutions? So I'll show you a little quote by one of my favorite people. Albert Einstein, we have a similar hairdo. When you look at what Einstein said, strange is our situation here upon earth, each of us comes for a short visit, not knowing why, yet sometimes seeming for a divine purpose. From the standpoint of daily life, however, there is one thing that we do know, that we are here for the sake of others. For the countless unknown souls whose fate we are connected to by a bond of sympathy, many times a day I realize how much my outer and inner life is built upon the labors of people, both living and dead, and how earnestly I must exert myself in order to give in return how much I have received. I would like to personally thank you Representing 65,000 associates of Mars Incorporated, I thank you. I thank you, Ted Amsterdam, for this opportunity. And I hope I've shown you at least a little bit about the notion of unprecedented and uncommon collaboration, which is the only way forward to a sustainable future. Thank you.